Shipwreck at the Bottom of the World, Chapter 18, The Alps of the Southern Ocean. Shackleton, Worsley, and Crean set off, climbing toward a pass through ankle-deep snow. Still tired and out of condition from their long months of confinement and their voyages, the men found the hiking a strain. Worsley continued to navigate. Laying their outline map of the island on the snow with a compass, he would sight ahead to a distant pass or peak and take a bearing by that. Four miles from their starting point, they had to rope up for security. The footing was sometimes tricky and all were weak. Deep crevices snaked across their path from time to time. Shackleton went in the lead, breaking the trail. The bright moon the bright moonlight showed us that the interior was tremendously broken, Shackleton wrote. High peaks, impassable cliffs, steep snow slopes, and sharply descending glaciers could be seen in all directions with stretches of snow plain overlaying the ice sheet of the interior. To avoid tiring themselves, the boss decided they should make a brief halt every 15 minutes. They threw themselves on their backs and caught their breath, looking up at the mist-covered mountains gleaming white in the moonlight and sucked on handfuls of snow to ease their thirst. After two minutes, they would haul themselves up again and continue. At eight o'clock, the sun rose and they continued tramping steadily upward toward the great range of mountains in their path. The only sound was the crunch of their footsteps in the snow. They were making for a pass they had spotted. By noon, they reached its summit. Breathing hard, sweating with the effort of hiking through knee-deep snow, they pulled themselves up and peered over. On the other side was a sheer drop. Ice falls glittered in the sun below them as a hard breeze buffeted their faces. There was nothing to do but go back down the way they had come and angle off toward the next pass. Halfway up to the next gap, Shackleton called a halt for a meal. They ate on the snow their chest heaving. Then they pushed themselves up again and struggled onto the next gap. The way down the other side was just as impossible and their hearts sank with disappointment. Swallowing their dismay, they trudged down through their own footsteps and began flanking the next peak to reach another pass. They were about 4,000 feet above sea level and the temperature was as alpine as the terrain. As they slogged through the snow, a strange feeling began to grow on each of them. The three discovered long afterward that they all had the feeling that there was a fourth. Even now and again, I find myself counting our party, Shackleton, Cream, and I, and who was the other, Worsley wrote later. Of course, there were only three, but it is strange that in mentally reviewing the crossing, we should always think of a fourth and then correct ourselves. When I look back at those days, Shackleton added, I do not doubt that Providence guided us. I know that during that long march of 36 hours over the unnamed mountains and glaciers of South Georgia, it often seemed to me that we were four, not three. Later, some people found religious significance in the men's experience. Others put the fourth presence down to the psychological, down the psychological and physical strain the men were under. At the time, however, Shackleton, Worsley, and Crean did not discuss it. Together, the three men dragged themselves up to the third pass. For the third time, they found that they could not make the descent on the other side. They gritted their teeth and trudged down again. A long snowfield lay between them and the next gap, and on crossing it, they discovered a crevice so deep that two battleships could have been hidden in it, as Worsley said. They zigzagged to the right and reached the saddle of the fourth pass as night fell. We'll try it, Shackleton said. He started down, cutting steps in the ice with the ax. Sea fog was sweeping in behind them and the light was fading quickly. They crept down 200 yards, feeling the angle of the slope grow easier with each step. Shackleton paused to let Worsley and Crean catch up with him, coiling the slack rope between them as they came. Below them, the snowy slope disappeared in the darkness. They had no idea where it ended, if it dropped off into space, or came to rest in a snowfield. At the speed they were climbing down, they could not get off the peak that night. To be trapped at the summit where the wind was coldest and strongest was too dangerous. 
They would surely freeze to death. The men peered ahead. Shackleton gave them each an inquiring look and then said again, We'll try it. It's a devil's of a risk, but we've got to take it. Worsley and Cream were shocked. The boss, normally so cautious, was suggesting they slide down the mountain. What if we hit a rock, Crane asked. Can we stay where we are, Shackleton replied. What if the slope doesn't level up, Worsley wandered aloud. Shackleton's voice rose a bit. Can we stay where we are? The men had no answer for him. Silently, they placed their coiled ropes underneath them and sat in a line with their knees around the man in front, tobogganers with no toboggan. And so, locked together, we let go, Worsley wrote. I was never more scared in my life than for the first 30 seconds. The speed was terrific. I think we all gasped at the hair-raising shoot into darkness. Then, to our joy, the slope curved out, and we shot into a bank of soft white snow. Excuse me, of soft snow. We estimated we had shot down a mile in two or three minutes and had lowered our altitude by two or three thousand feet. We stood up and shook hands, very pleased with ourselves. They moved on a bit from the bottom of the slope just in case they had triggered an avalanche. Then they got the primus going and boiled down some snow so they could cook their hooish. <clears throat> they had one cook pot and three spoons, and when the hooish was ready, they took turns dipping their spoons in one at a time. Crean's got the largest spoon, Shackleton complained jokingly. Holy smoke, look at the skipper's mouth, Crean shot back. Worsley took advantage of the argument to get an extra dig into the pot with his spoon. From months of training, they were able to eat their hooish boiling hot. The warmth spread through their shivering bodies, giving them the energy to start marching again. They had been hiking for 16 hours. They were making their way steadily eastward through the razorbacks that formed South Georgia's spine. The moon began to rise behind the mountains ahead of them, showing them the way through another pass. By midnight, they were at the top and looking down at a long ocean bay. By two in the morning, they were down far enough to see rocky islets below them. They couldn't be sure what bay they were looking at, however, and to be sure of hitting the whaling stations, they kept to the east. As they descended, they found themselves in an area riddled with crevices and realized they were on a glacier. Judging it too risky to cross in the dark, Shackleton turned to march them around it. At five, they called a halt halfway up another slope. Worsley and Crane began to nod off. I'll wake you in half an hour, Shackleton said. He kept watch, not daring to go to sleep. All his experience in the Antarctic had proven to him that going to sleep under those conditions could be his last act. When 10 minutes had passed, he nudged his companions awake. You've been asleep for 30 minutes, he said. Worsley and Crane shook themselves, as refreshed as if they actually had slept for half an hour. Shackleton's lie gave them 20 minutes of fantasy sleep. The men stood and braced themselves to push forward up the steep grade. Sometime after six o'clock, they reached the gap. Although it was still dark, they could make out the white shape of the land stretched out below them. To the east, they recognized Stromness Bay. Their destination was actually in sight. Crean fussed with the promise stove as Shackleton and Worsley surveyed the terrain. Then Crean called out, Hooish, and the men gathered around the pot with their spoons. What's the time? Shackleton asked Worsley. The skipper pulled his chronometer out from beneath his shirt. 6.55. We'll listen for the whaling station's whistle, Shackleton said. They waited, almost holding their breath in the still frigid air. The minutes ticked by. They watched the hands on the chronometer creep towards 7 o'clock. And then, from far below, came a distant blast of the factory whistle. The three men shook hands and laughed. No music ever sounded so sweet to their ears. It was a moment hard to describe, Shackleton wrote, wrote later. Pain and aches, boat journeys, marches, hunger, and fatigue seemed to belong to the limbo of forgotten things. And there remained only the perfect contentment that comes of work accomplished. The fuel for the camp stove was finished, so they threw it aside. But there were still miles to go before the safety of the whaling station. 
they did not celebrate for long. Below them, a steep, icy slope slanted downward. Day after day, the winter sun had melted the snow on the eastward-facing slope, and the night's frost had hardened it until it was a solid, frozen, glittering wall. Shackleton chopped steps in the ice, and they inched their way down. When the slope eased a little bit, they lowered themselves down on their backs, kicking in heel holes as they descended for a thousand feet to the sea. Gentoo penguins and elephant sea seals oogled as they began clambering over boulders along the shore. They kept to the coast for several miles, sometimes struggling over ice and snow, sometimes trudging through deep sand and around rocks. For a while, the only sounds were the scabbling of their boots over the rocks, their own harsh breathing, and the occasional belch or bellow from an elephant seal. Then when a glacier blocked their path, they had to turn inland again, wearily climbing uphill. At 1.15, they were staring down onto Stromness Bay from a 3,000-foot summit. Below them, two whaling ships were as tiny as insects, hoarsely yelled and waved in a futile, in a futile attempt to draw attention to them. Shackleton led the way down. Soon, they found themselves following a stream of snow melt through a narrow ravine. The sides of the gully drew closer and closer together until the three men were forced to slosh through the glacial water, sometimes up to their knees. Then the ravine, then the ravine came to an abrupt end. The water poured away into space. Cautiously, the men stepped to the edge and looked down. Below them was a frozen waterfall stretching 50 feet to the ground. Unless they wanted to splash back upstream for a mile and find another route, they would have to climb down the waterfall. <clears throat> there was nothing to tie the rope to. Worsley held it, while first Shackleton and then Crean went over the edge. They went down the rope as sailors do, letting it slip through their hands and not putting their weight on it just before they hit the bottom. At the top, Worsley bunched the end of the rope up and jammed it under some rocks. If he didn't put his weight on the road until the bottom, it might just hold. Worsley stepped off into the air, plummeting downward with the rope whipping through his hands. Shackleton and Crane caught him as he fell, and his full weight yanked on the rope. It held. Startled, the three men stared up at the top of the waterfall and tugged on the rope. It wouldn't budge. It might have been frozen, but they couldn't understand what was holding it. Shrugging, they turned and left the rope hanging where it was. They didn't need it any longer. They had a few miles of frozen marsh to cross, and then they were within sight of the whaling station. So far, no one had spotted them. Boss, there might be some women here, Worsley said nervously. What of it? Well, look at us, Worsley replied. They were scarecrows, their clothes in tatters, their faces black with soot and grease, their hair and beards matted. They hadn't bathed in months, and they had been living in the same clothes since abandoned and ship. They came around the corner of a building and startled two Norwegian boys who took one look at them and bolted. Around the men was the familiar, pervasive stench of the whaling factory, smelling almost as bad as they did themselves. Staggering slightly, shaking with deep chills, Shackleton, Worsley, and Crean climbed the steps of the factory manager's house. A foreman came to the door. Captain Sorrell, is he here? Shackleton asked Worsley. What do you want? The man replied in English, eyeing them with amazement. I want to see him. I know him, Shackleton answered. The foreman went inside, and a few moments later, Captain Sorrell came out to look at them had last seen him a year and a half earlier when he toasted Endurance and her crew. Do you know me, Sorrel? Shackleton asked the big Norwegian whaler. No. Who the hell are you? Sorrel demanded. My name is Shackleton. Sorrel gaped in astonishment at the three ragged castaways and then turned his head away and wept. What Shackleton did not know was that Aurora, the relief ship, had been sent to meet him had met a similar fate to endurance. It, 
too, had been trapped in the ice since the previous year, and although not crushed, it was badly damaged. Just weeks earlier, on March 24, 1916, an, om an ominous message from her radio had been picked up in Australia. Hull severely strained. Ship released from ice March 14. Wireless appeals for relief ship, ship sent during winter. No acknowledgement. Ship proceeding. Port Chalmers, New Zealand, Jury Rudder. No anchors short of fuel. Aurora was limping away and the headlines in the London papers read, Is Shackleton safe? Mystery of the Great White South? Everyone had assumed that Shackleton's team was trekking over land only to find themselves abandoned. Now, Shackleton, Worsley, and Crean stood dazed and exhausted, not on the edge of Antarctica, but on South Georgia Island, the last place anyone expected to find them. They could hardly believe what they had just done, and they were as overcome with emotion as Sorrell was. It was like this, Shackleton said much later. The thought of those fellows on Elephant Island kept us going all the time. It might have been different if we'd had only ourselves to think about. You can get so tired in the snow, particularly if you're hungry, that sleep just seems the best thing life has to give. But if you're a leader, a fellow that other fellows look to, you've got to keep going. That was the thought which sailed us through the hurricane and tugged us up and down those mountains. And when we got to the whaling station, it was the thought of those comrades which made us so mad with joy that the reaction beats all effort to describe it. We didn't so much feel that we were safe as that they were saved. <laughs> Sorrel put his arms around the three weary men and ushered them tenderly into the house. Shackleton, Worsley, and Crean were given hot baths and food and then taken to a bedroom where they collapsed. They slept the night through, sometimes shouting out in nighttime terrors of great waves or danger on the ice. The, Nor the Norwegians at the whaling factory crowded Sorrell's house, asking the manager over and over again to repeat the story Shackleton had told. Even for men accustomed to a hard life in a terrifying ocean, they could hardly believe what Shackleton and his men had endured. The next morning, Worsley was taken aboard a whale catcher called Samson and went to King Hakan Bay to rescue McCarthy, McNeish, and Vincent. We thought the skipper would have come back, McCarthy grumbled as a clean-shaven Worsley jumped out onto the beach. Well, I am here, Worsley said with a laugh and the other men stared in disbelief. The James Caird was brought on board as well, and the whalemen treated the boat like a priceless object. They were men who knew the heroism of the boat itself. Back at the whaling station, Shackleton was busy organizing a ship to set out for Elephant Island. Telegrams were already racing across the oceans. Sir, Ar Sir Ernest Shackleton safe ran the headlines. The story of the Endurance's crew's remarkable ordeal was already dinner conversation in London. But the boss had no idea what he would find when he returned to the desolate spot where he left his men.